Okay, I think we're streaming. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. I'm really excited to hear all of you, like learn more about you guys and um, hear your perspectives. My name is Ryan and my pronouns are she, hers. Um, this next hour will be a discussion of rethink per rethinking prevention in gun violence and violence in general, focusing on communities and youth activism. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk and discussion around gun violence prevention, both in our country and communities. Um, and there are a lot of ways to come at gun violence prevention through education, legislation, communities, youth, all with mixed results. Some have, some attempts at preventing gun violence have been successful in their goals and some have had the opposite effect on reducing gun violence rates in their communities. Um, I think young people and communities have been a big part in prevention. And I think you guys are all big parts of that. Um, we have with us some amazing guests today who are going to share their thoughts and perspectives on gun violence and gun violence prevention. Um, we have some questions prepared to ask you guys. Um, but if anyone in the audience has any questions, you can send them to Lily and we will try and get to them at the end. Um, would you um, guests mind taking a second to introduce yourselves? Ladies first. Okay, I can start. Um, hi guys, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to, to um, have this discussion with you all. My name is Sierra Hinkson and I am a student organizer at the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence, which is a public health organization that uses an equity lens to um, implement policy solutions and programs to stop gun violence in all its forms. And um, I'm also a junior at Vanderbilt University and I'm from New York City. Hello, my name is Angela Lang. I use she, her pronouns, and I probably serve as the executive director of Block, Black Leaders Organizing for Communities. And we're a year round civic engagement organization really dedicated to um, educating and uplifting the Black community when it comes to advocacy and politics. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jamal Smith. I'm the Community Violence Prevention Manager for the City of Milwaukee Health Department uh, Office of Violence Prevention. My work is centered around public policy analysis, community engagement on violence prevention, as well as the education and training on our blueprint for peace. Cool, thank you. Um, we have some questions to ask you guys. Um, you can take turns answering, or you can all answer whatever works best for you. Um, our first one is, what effect does violence have on our communities? Um, okay, since I, I began last time, I can, I can just kind of start it off. Um, so the effects of violence on our communities is really, it's really vast. So we have of course, the physical effects. So we have physical injury and death. Um, and then along with that comes also the psychological effects. So we have the um, trauma of not only experiencing being a, a victim or survivor of gun violence, but the trauma of um, witnessing or having a family member that um, experienced gun violence and all the effects that that can have like PTSD, um, depression, um, suicidal ideation, um, and then gun violence, of course, also can break apart families. It can hurt community ties. And um, yeah, I mean, also I mean, like children finishing school. So we have effects on like educational outcomes, not only public health outcomes. And then of course there are like fiscal impacts like lost wages and such, but that's, that's what I would say. So when we talk about uh, violence and the effects of violence, I think another question to ask is uh, what are essentially the various forms of violence, right? There's always the conversation around physical violence, whether that's gun violence, um, non-fatal shootings, homicides, aggravated assaults, simple assaults, but we don't discuss systemic violence enough. And I think that if we're having a discussion about systemic violence and how that trickles down into 
uh, what we see within our communities around gun violence itself, then, I, then we're doing ourselves a disservice around prevention. So uh, looking at the effects of violence, we're, we're talking about the effects of poverty, the effects of substance abuse, of mental health, of homelessness, but then we're also talking about policies and procedures and institutions that created the systems leading to a lot of the violence that's being perpetuated on communities. For example, standing right here in Milwaukee, we're talking about the impact of redlining, segregation and the likes. You know, housing crisis is violence, right? And we don't acknowledge that enough. We just say it's a housing crisis. But given that that was intentionally done to particular communities of people, especially black and brown communities, that's an intentional act that equates violence. So when you look at the trauma that is that has occurred, you know, to Sierra's point, both historically and, and cur in current context, and how that continues to permeate throughout our communities, then we see the, the psychological impact, the physiological impact, the physical impact on, on people within those communities, which leads to the engagement of risky behaviors going towards violence. Then you couple that with this country who is fixated on guns and ammunition. Right, no other country has guns or the possession of guns the way the United States does. We have more guns and ammunition than we have people. So, access to such violent, uh, such violent instruments, plus the trauma that's been that has been perpetuated on communities based on uh, disparate practices, that's a that's pretty much an equation for seeing the epidemic of violence that we that we continuously see. So, if we're gonna you know, when we talk about violence, it's important that we address every form of it in order for there to really be a strong transformative prevention campaign. Yeah, I agree. I think um, there are so many times that we don't talk a lot about all the other ways that things can be violent in our community. You know, like even one thing in particular, we don't talk about police shootings and police murders as violence. We don't incorporate that as a part of the gun violence conversation when um, police literally are shooting people. But for whatever reason, that is left out of the conversation. Um, or we even see how um, different communities are are talked about in, in terms of violence and specifically gun violence. Um, you know, not to trigger folks, but if there is like a mass shooting and it's but it's done by like a white person, a lot of specifically a white man, it's oh they must have had mental health challenges um, versus is if there is an um, interpersonal violence dispute, we aren't talking about the systemic ways that have actually led for them, as just Jamal was saying, to be in those situations. And so I think, um, you know, we need to, I think as a country, start to have a broader discussion about what violence is um, and how that also manifests and how that trauma manifests in our communities. But then also um, the different disparities of how we talk about gun violence and violence as a whole, as it relates to different communities of color as well. Yeah, thank you all for sharing. Um, for the next question, um, what has been successful in your work at preventing violence? Um, in contrast, what hasn't worked very well? Y'all trying to get me fired. Uh, <laughs> I will say what has worked is community engagement. Um, there has to be an, a heavy reliance on getting communities involved in violence prevention work, especially those that have been highly impacted by violence. That was the whole purpose of the Blueprint for Peace, right? This, this is a, a community-driven violence prevention strategic plan that was released in 2016, but it came from the voices of the community, right? We led focus groups, we had youth surveys, over 1,000 young people participated in this survey. Um, Lit and Block were a part of, of helping the, the development of the process. Um, we had steering committee meetings where we brought community-based organizations together with business executives, but also with systemic partners to have conversations around what violence prevention actually looks like. But that required everybody to be engaged. It couldn't just be a bureaucratic approach where a governmental entity comes in and says, this is what we think is best for you in terms of violence prevention. Well, we've seen how that's happened, right? So clearly their governmental inter uh, interruption has been law enforcement. So if we're really talking about the changing of prevention of, of violence and towards a preventative model, then there has to be a look at it from a public health lens and how we're elevating the people, uh, people's quality of life, which is more about prevention, but that requires everybody to be at the table to have that discussion. Uh, what has not worked 
is the overly reliance of on, on law enforcement and the underfunding of programs that are elevating violence prevention, right? There's no reason why we should be giving so much money to one entity to address an issue that they can't do alone. So if we're in a city that's over, that's almost 600,000 people, you're asking 1,700 rank and file officers to police a city of 600,000. That's impossible, especially when the, the issues that are concerning a lot of communities go beyond policing. And we've depended on policing to elevate mental, to, to address mental health, to address substance abuse, to address poverty, to address homelessness, to address a lack of quality health care, you know, a uh, lack of education equity for black and brown students. We're asking police to address those issues when that's not in their purview. So if there are, uh, there are other programs that are addressing those issues and elevating an advocacy piece for communities like a block or uh, other organizations, there needs to be funding that are going to more going to those programs and towards those initiatives than depending on one entity. But because this country is so reliant on on punishment and 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 the uh, <laughs> I mean just the whole idea of a punitive length, uh, lens. We continuously are in a, in, in a cyclical uh, era when it comes to violence. I think to, to build off of that, and Jamal, I'm going to say some stuff. Tell me if I'm out of line, because I'm going to name drop y'all's office for a second. Um, you know, I think what's what's important to note is um, the city budget as well. Um, people talk about how budgets are moral documents. And if we need to really talk about our priorities. And as we talk about policing, right, we understand that law enforcement does not prevent crime. They do not prevent violence. They respond to it. And a lot of times, if we're being honest, they perpetuate it in our communities. And so we continue, and I encourage, this is a, I know usually we say like call to actions and stuff for the end, but I encourage people and everyone that is watching to pay attention to the city budget, which is starting to kick off because we spend as a city nearly 50% of our budget going to the police department while things like the Office of Violence Prevention, which is housed in the health department, right? The whole health department itself is only getting two to 3%, right? And that's the health department as a whole, which also houses the Office of Violence Prevention. It's in the word, it's violence prevention. Our priorities are skewed in a way that we are not serious as a city about actually preventing violence because we are not actually investing into that work. Um, and so, you know, I, I say that stat all the time because I think it is so telling of our priorities as a city. And then we get really confused when violence erupts every summer, when it's a little too hot out that day. Um, and, and I do think it's important to be able to support the trusted messengers on the ground whether it's block or other organizations, you know, there's been so many times some of our team members will come up to me and they will say, Angela, like block has saved my life. Being able to plug into, you know, something positive and being able to educate my community on politics or civic engagement, that has saved me from doing X, Y, and Z out in the streets. We've heard that so many times and we don't consider ourselves a violence prevention organization, but when you give people um, and you support people the way that they need to be supported and you're investing in those resources accordingly, then it naturally happens. But people, I don't think our city does a good enough job of actually taking that seriously because I think our funding priorities would be a lot different if we did. Yeah, and, and speaking to your point about funding and investment, um, not only do we have to make these investments, but they have to be really intentional and targeted um, because a problem that we see with a lot of investments in community violence intervention programs is that it's uh, one-time funding, the funding is not consistent, funding is not adequate, or um, we see a lot, a lot of cities have implemented like micro grants. So you give like um, a couple dozen organizations $5,000 and that's the only funding that they get. Maybe they can do something small, but that's not going to create um, real um, consistent and meaningful change. So we need to see programs that are adequately funded, consistently funded. Um, yeah. What you all were saying ties into the next question, which is, have you seen enough action at the federal level when it comes to community-based violence prevention? Okay, I guess I'll go. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, what we did see from the Biden administration that we have not seen in past administrations is the $5 billion investment into community violence, uh, violence prevention programs. You know, uh, a lot of evidence-based programs, like for example, uh, a, a program out of the Office of Violence Prevention is our 414 Life of uh, Violence Interrupters, which is a program based off of the Cure Violence model out of Chicago. Uh, and the idea is uh, getting, you know, to Angela's point, trusted or credible messengers within the communities to really address uh, a lot of the conflicts that is happening on ground. And because of the fact that they are credible messengers, that helps in terms of, of alleviating a lot of potential violent situations, right? Honestly, without a lot of violence interrupters, there could be more homicides across the country than we've seen, right? So one, you know, the fact that there needs to be a stronger investment into violence interruption programs, but then two, uh, in terms of capacity, increasing capacity around um, violence prevention uh, across the board, I think that's a part of the $5 billion that, that, uh, that Biden had uh, invested. We've never seen that, right? And the fact that there was, and then just to be totally honest, a lot of the people who, who pushed that were, were Black, right? When we look at uh, the Community Justice Action Fund, uh, Erica, people like Erica Ford and Greg Jackson and the likes, um, you know, Amber Goodwin, you know, a lot of them were the ones that pushed that funding and we're really advocating strong on the federal level to get Biden and his administration to even allocate $5 billion. That goes back to the point of saying having people who are invested in communities highly impacted by violence be the drivers of the solutions to elevate prevention, right? So the fact that this is happening is unprecedented. It's unprecedented investment. Hopefully there'll be some growth off of that, off of that $5 billion. I mean, I'm sure there'll be some action around the ARPA funding as well, the American Rescue Plan, but we're seeing money that is being allocated. Now is just a mere fact of increasing advocacy efforts to ensure to both Sierra and Angela's point that there's an equitable distribution in areas that are highly impacted that normally see divestment more than investment. Yeah, um, just kind of like piggybacking off of that point, Jamal, We've seen like the introduction of legislation like Break the Cycle Act um, by Booker and Horsford, which is like really exciting. And to see that it's specifically targeting, well, sp specifically um, mentioning community violence intervention models, naming the models um, that we can invest in, like you said, the street outreach and hospital based intervention, wraparound services. So we're targeting those root causes. And I think there's even more space to target those root causes, right? So if we, if on the federal level, we were able to um, kind of open up funding for in different departments like um, substance abuse and mental health services administration or within the DOE or um, housing and urban development, if there were more opportunities for these departments to um, offer funding into the root causes of gun violence on a federal level, I think that that could also be really effective. Um, if no one else has anything to add, um, we can move on to the next question. Um, what power do youth have in gun violence prevention? There's a lot of parts to this one. Are there enough youth in politics? And for those of you who are um, working, does your work involve youth civic engagement? Um, if you want, Sierra, do you want to go first since you are a little bit younger? Yes, I can start. I am 19, so um, I, I am a youth, a young person involved in gun violence prevention. And I would say there, there really is an impressive amount of young people involved in gun violence prevention and, and um, you know, like pushing that forward. And I think a lot of people, I mean, although there is like an increasing amount of um, like bigger organizations like March for Our Lives forming, young people have always been at the forefront of social movements. So this is not something new. And the reason that young people are always at the forefront of social movements is because um, there's that fresh perspective, right? Every, there, there needs to be generational change. There's a, there's a reason that there is generational shifts every so often. So that's why young people um, are often at the forefront of these movements because they're not afraid to kind of shake up the establishment. So the, the perspective of young people is invaluable 
in um, gun violence prevention spaces. And also if we're talking about statistics, like young black men aged um, 15 to 34 make up 2% of the population, but they make up 37% of homicides in this country. So if you're 15, if you're a 15 year old black man and you're being affected by gun violence, of course you can also take action to um, stop gun violence in your community. And we've seen so many great organizations um, across the country that are um, working on working on preventing violence in their communities, like WAVE, like we have Good Kids Mad City in Chicago, yeah, Philly in Philadelphia. So um, I'm really encouraged by the amount of young people that are working in violence prevention. Of course, there could, there could always be more um, involved in politics. I think a good way for young people to get involved in politics is like working on local campaigns. Um, you can do like political advocacy, like trying to get meetings with your local congressperson. Um, young people can run for like city council, maybe not like teenagers, but you can run for like city council in positions like that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to give um, a big shout out to Lit Leaders Igniting Transformation. Um, we try to work with them wherever we can. I am now 32, so I acknowledge I'm not a youth anymore. Um, but, you know, it's it's the people at Lit that have been able to engage uh, young folks, and especially youth of color, um, and to things like the school board. You know, they were testifying and saying, no, we don't want um, more contracts with MPD. We want more guidance counselors. We want things like art. Um, and so being able to engage young people in that way, I think, has been incredibly powerful. Um, at Block, we don't consider ourselves a youth um, organization, although we do have a a lot of young people that just happen to, to be a part of our team. And so um, what's really interesting is to kind of watch some of these intergenerational dialogues that happen um, in our own office. And we hear a lot of young people say, you know, I've been impacted by this, or I've been impacted by violence in this way. And the reason I'm at block is because I want to help my younger cousins. And, and these are people that are like 19, 20, 21 that are with our folks that are saying that they want to get more involved with block because they want to be a resource in the community um, to folks that they know that are younger than them. Um, and then we also see we're actually in the, the the thick of it right now. We're having conversations. We're planning a back to school bash. Um, and this was driven largely by our older folks that said, what can we do to support young people that are going back to school in the middle of a pandemic where it's like really difficult and it's a challenge to try and do this either hybrid style or this virtual learning. And so I think, um, you know, as, as was mentioned, uh, young people have always been at the center of um, uh, every social movement and social change. Um, while people may not also put respect on youth's name, we, we see it and we know it. And I think um, there has been a little bit of a shift. I think as a um, as a country, we've, we've started to embrace um, youth activism and youth organizing a little bit more in the last several years than I think we have been. I think, you know, when I was coming up as a, as a younger person um, in my early 20s and started to figure out what organizing was, uh, there were so many times that like older folks were just like, nope, this is how it's always been done. And sometimes it, um, it's been hard to break into some of the organizing as a younger person, but I feel like that is shifting. Um, and I think that as long as people are involved either it's directly around violence prevention or gun violence or whatever the issues are i think we do see as as long as people are engaged in something then people are able to be that resource in the community and make their voices heard um and things like the school board meetings and saying no you know we don't want tsa style metal detectors we want other things and so i think um you know right now as someone that i feel like i'm bordering an elder millennial at this point um really understanding and what is it like for uh, people my age to to start to mentor and to start to support uh, younger folks and, and really um, start to prepare to pass that mantle and pass that torch. Because at the end of the day, this is this is young people's futures that we're talking about. And we're seeing how young people start to be impacted more and more um, by things like mass shootings and school shootings as well. And, um, you know, we love to talk about directly impacted people, um, but sometimes we don't want to like pass that microphone to youth. And so I think um, we need to make sure that we're continuing to engage people and to really highlight and to amplify youth voice um, as if we're actually going to be serious about addressing the root causes of violence. When you start seeing adults attack youth for their perspective and their platforms, that's how you know youth have power. Like, you know, even we saw it in terms of the attacks on the March of, for Our Lives group uh, and others, you know, after the Park Lawn shooting specifically. Uh, but just the mere fact that you've seen um, 
news stations and news reporters, you know, Fox News, uh, the Laura Ingrahams of the world, the Tucker Carlson's, uh, the Sean Hannity, like all of those went after young people, right, for speaking out against gun violence. That's how you know young people have power. Because if there wasn't, if they didn't have any power, they wouldn't even bring them on. That wouldn't even be a topic of discussion. But because they know that those young people, their perspectives, their fearlessness, their brilliance, uh, their drive, uh, their dedication to the work, they know that that, that, they're, that is something that's going to be influential and can actually change the, in, the entire makeup of what um, gun violence looks like. That puts fear in the minds of those who profit off of it. So I think young people have to realize, and I think they are, you know, to both Sierra and Angela's point, young people know they have power now and they're stepping into it. I think the difference is in, in 2021, now you have other platforms that you can use to elevate that power, right? Whether it's technology, uh, you know, social media, um, so you can learn civics in three minutes on TikTok, right? That didn't happen when we were growing up. I'm 40, right? That didn't happen when I was growing up. But the fact that you have all of these technological platforms that you can use in addition to the intelligence that in the, and the, uh, the drive and the strength that these young people have, they go, they're a problem. <laughs> and, and that's, that's a level of power that others do not want to see because it can actually break the status quo that many people are profiting off of. So I'm encouraged. I, I love to see young people in action. And I, I think here at the Office of Violence Prevention, we have a youth in initiative. Our youth coordinator, T'Angelo Cargile, has been leading a lot of work around youth development and youth engagement uh, as a representative of the Office of Violence Prevention. And we want to increase that, right? Because we can't do this work without young people. That's impossible. It's not, it's not going to be able to happen if it's just thinking that all adults have all the responses and young people with their innovation, innovational ideas, innovative ideas are sitting there like this, just waiting for somebody to say, can you listen to us? Right. So there, there has to be all there has to be space for young people to continue to be part of all social justice movements. And just imagine if there was a list of, of, of youth groups throughout the country that have been doing work, not just about gun violence prevention, but just social justice movements, period. You know how long that list would be? Because there are so many groups that are, I'm like, I'm thinking when everybody makes a, 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 a statement about the, the, the carnage in Chicago. I'm thinking of groups like BYP 100, like the Black Youth Project 100, right? There's so many youth groups that are doing some amazing work in, in, in areas like a Chicago, like a New York, Baltimore, Milwaukee, Detroit, you know, all types of areas where it's happening, even in Florida, right? So where, where the, parkland shoot, the parkland shooting happened, like there's young people that are, that are from all different backgrounds and different, you know, uh, experiences and walks of life are all coming together under this umbrella of gun violence prevention. So elevating and supporting that work, and sometimes adults just getting out, getting the hell out the way, is a great idea in terms of really making, ensuring that youth realize the power they truly have in this prevention work. Yeah, thank you. I've, I've seen a ton of people all over the country and in my community, a bunch of people my age doing all kinds of change and like even just in my school, I've seen kids do more than some of the teachers can. Um, a next question. Um, sorry, I lost my tr last track. How important is community buy-in when it comes to community-based solutions? Um, I I would say that community buy-in, of course, is essential, but it's essential because the solutions need to come from the community. It shouldn't be like a top-down approach where it's like, okay, let's get a bunch of researchers together and figure out what's the best thing to do and then present it to community members and see what they think. Mm -hmm. You need to involve community members and those directly impacted um, in every step of the process. Because community, if the community doesn't believe in whatever program that you wanna implement, it's not gonna be successful. You need people to, you need people to, um, believe in the program, want to invest in the program, and for it to be realistic for their life, you know, just because you may like a program doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to, um, it's something that can realistic, realistically work out because of course there are barriers and, and, and boundaries. Um, so community buy-in is 
is not only essential, but central, I would say. Yeah, I was going to use the same word. I was going to say essential. Honestly, couldn't I, I can't add anything else. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, moving on. What would you say to a young person or anyone in general looking to become more active in community engagement or violence prevention? I would say um, just to jump in feet first, right? Um, I think a lot of times, you know, we sometimes wait for the adults in the room to get their stuff together. Um, and if we keep waiting on that, that's not always going to happen. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think for me as, as, you know, the fact that I got my organizing start um, as a young person, um, you know, my senior year of high school is when I started to organize and not realize I was organizing. Um, I think it's just, if, if there is something that is in your spirit to, to move you to action, do it. Um, if you are, you know, someone that sees other organizations, definitely find organizations to get involved with, kind of learn, um, kind of just soak it all in. Uh, that's how I kind of got my start with organizing personally is it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of trial by fire. It's sometimes you kind of just figure it out, find a mentor, find someone that can um, guide you through that. And unfortunately, sometimes you won't even see some of those spaces. And so if you don't see those, those spaces exist, um, create that space because you may not know when someone else may need that space as well. And you're likely not alone. Um, that's kind of how I got to where I am now. Um, I didn't see a, a particular space around Black organizing when it came to politics and through this lens. And so I helped found Block to fill in that space. I didn't anticipate to do that. Sometimes it kind of just happens. And so even if you don't see a very clear path for yourself, sometimes you, not, you might need to be the one to forge that path. And it's all about making sure that you have your people um, that are there to support you 100% of the way. Um, and if there's other, like I said, mentors or people that have been around a little bit and have some experience, I know for me, that's something I, um, I feel very strongly about because organizing um, as a young person is not always easy. And if I can do anything that I can to minimize some of the BS that I went through when I was coming up in, in the trial by fire organizing, I wanna be able to eliminate that as much as possible. And so there are people out there, but um, as long as you have that passion and that dedication and that drive, you can't teach that, right? We can teach you all the other things around organizing but as long as you have that center kind of core value, there is a place for you um, somewhere to organize. And sometimes that means you have to have the flexibility to be the one to create that space yourself as well. Um, yeah, so what would I say to young people in this space? I would say also, in addition to everything that Angela just said, very, very true, um, be creative and where you can plug in. So there's so many spaces where you can get involved. You can um, volunteer at like soup kitchens, start a, uh, like a community refrigerator where like community members can come and, you know, grab food. So that helps with food insecurity or, or um, donate to food pantries. You can um, invest in like local businesses just to reinvest in your community and just be creative in all the ways that you, you can um, kind of help your community to thrive because when you uh, like help, when you work at those root causes, these are things that kind of um, ameliorate violence in our communities. And I would also say, don't be afraid to take up space. Um, as a young person, you walk as a young person. And also um, I can say as a black woman, there's a lot of times where I feel like, um, do I have the right to have an opinion right now? Do I have the right to share my opinion right now? Will anyone care if I share my opinion right now? Um, and you just have to get over that hump and say that what I have to say is important. I'm important. Um, I deserve to share this opinion. And um, I think that that's something that's really important for young people to remember is that you have the right to take up space. The final thing I'll say to, all, to, what, to Angela and Sierra, which I think were all um, excellent ideas is um, really focus on building relationships. You know, have a conversation with other young people who may have the same mindset as you, you know, find out who some of those young people are and, you know, 
really start to have conversations and and come together because you know some people get nervous in terms of having a conversation individually but if there's an opportunity for for building a collective that's a whole thing around organizing right and, and mobilizations relationship buildings in order for you to build that base uh that's necessary uh with having universal and having universal language along that base uh which really elevates the message then brings about the action so uh you know building relationships with other with other young people, Angela already mentioned uh, having a, a mentor, but also, you know, study some of the old uh, uh, social justice movements, right? Um, go back to, heck, we're talking about LGBTQ, go back to the Stonewall days where, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, Fair Housing Act. You can go right here and, and look up the uh, the youth commandos with Bell Phillips and, and Father James Grappi and, and, you know, study what were some of the, the, uh, the tactics that they used, right? The youth commandos were no more than 17, right? So when you look at the fact that these young people, and they were actually playing, they were security. When you think about it, they were security for both Bell Phillips, Lloyd Barbie, and uh, Father James Grappi, right? Young people, in addition to being the voice of, uh, against uh, uh, housing discrimination, right? So study some of those, those old social justice movements, learn more about the tactics that they use, see how you can translate some of those today, but then also how can you build on those to fit in modern times, right? Because sometimes antiquated practices may not work in a, in a newer era, but you know some of them can give you a foundation to build on. Take advantage of technology, take advantage of social media. Please use that. We, got, we, have, we have so many fake, fake book, uh, Facebook activists on, we need to start seeing people that are coming on that are actually telling some truth. And young people have the ability to do that. Um, but there's so many ways in which uh, young people can be involved and young people should be involved. But you know, it's really, it's, it's really having, just, just being fearless, right? It's, you know, that's one thing I always appreciate when it comes to young people. It's just really having a case that I don't give a damn. And just being able to just come out and say how you feel and where you stand and and not really being concerned about the repercussions that are coming from that because trust trust us you're talking to two elder statesmen here the repercussions are coming but it's being able to stand on what you believe regardless of what somebody else says to you and pushing towards you know uh elevating that change Thank you. I think that's really important to all, everything that you all three of you said is really important to keep in mind, especially as a helping, well, I don't know what the correct word I'm looking for is, but an astounding, not astounding, sorry, wrong word choice. <laughs> um, as a aspiring youth activist myself, um, I think that's really important to keep in mind. As we come to a close, are there any final words that you can share about what like any final words or thoughts about the future of violence prevent prevention in our communities? Like, what do you think the future of violence prevention will look like? I think um, what I wanna leave folks with is um, kind of similar to what Jamal was saying. Um, don't be afraid to dream. I think there are so many times where um, I've heard this so many times and I do my hardest to make sure I don't say this to younger people. There are so many times a lot of us are stuck in our old ways. This is how we've traditionally done things. Um, and I'm thinking about like the budget, right? What do we do every year when we create our budget? We take the last budget and we just amend it. We make tweets, we make edits. What would it look like if we just started from scratch and built something of our dreams? I think, um, you know, this is, this is why we're in these tense moments right now because, um, young people are dreaming of a world that they want to live in and that doesn't always match with the the world that people want to maintain because that they want to maintain their own status in this world um but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't dream of a world where there isn't violence and, and oppression and how we get there um and it's going to be hard to dream when people don't want you to dream um it's it's hard to dream when everyone just wants to um, continue things the way that they always have been, but um, we're, we're trying to dream of a world that hasn't existed yet, 
And so that's difficult and it's hard for people to wrap their heads around um, and it makes people scared. Um, and we see things like January 6th, right, happen. And that's, um, that's the backlash that happens when young people specifically dream and demand a better future for themselves. You know, young people, I'm, I'm speaking as like a millennial, you know, we've seen things from like the um, 9-11 to, um, you know, the, the stock market crash after a lot of people were graduating college and, and whatnot and trying to enter into the workforce. There's so many things that young people have seen these days, um, and even more so with people that are younger than, than myself. And so we're owed a future of abundance and thriving, and we can only get there if we dream, um, but people don't want us to dream. And so I encourage people to continue to be bold and fearless, as Jamal says, um, and continue to dream of a world that we haven't created yet, but doesn't make it any less important. And uh, we should figure out how we get there. Even though we've never seen it ourselves, we have to figure out how to do it. And so continuing to um, be unapologetic in what we demand um, as, as our own futures. I second all of that. Same. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you all for sharing. Um, if you have any final remarks or anything else you want to say, if not, we can wrap this up. Thank you all for sharing. I think I know I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did too. If it's okay with everybody, I just want to take a screenshot really fast, just of our panel <laughs> for memories. See, right. technology. Is that what I was just technology. talking about? <laughs> See, that's, that's the benefit of meeting on somewhere like Zoom, right? So you can like have these like physical, physical proof of your meeting, but okay. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, lovely. <laughs>